In this video, I'd like to add to our set of kinematics equations that we that we can use, uh, and also do a little example at the end. So, we know that uh, our position changes at a rate equal to our velocity. We know that our velocity changes at a rate equal to our acceleration. So, so our position depends on our velocity, our velocity depends on our acceleration. It seems that our position should also depend on our acceleration in some way. Uh, so the, the equation that shows the relationship between these two, uh, the book shows a derivation of this. I'm not going to just do it on the board because the book does a good job. Um, it is in the middle of page seven, it looks like this. Um, so anyway, look, look for the book derivation of that. It involves plugging the average velocity into our constant position equation and, and multiplying some stuff together. Anyway, we will just start with the result and we'll, we'll explain what's going on. Okay. Uh, so this is our equation. This is the, um, I guess I would call this the position equation. And we have another equation for position that, uh, that only worked for constant velocity. This is the position equation um, for a changing velocity. because, you know, because this acceleration means that our velocity is changing. Okay, so a couple of things to point out here. Our velocity is the initial velocity, right? So our velocity now is changing from the end of our motion, or sorry, from the beginning of our motion to the end of our motion. So this is where the velocity starts. Uh, a is our acceleration. Both of these are the same times. So that's how much time has gone by from the beginning to the end. And this time is squared. So we have an equation that is no longer linear. This is the equation for a parabola, that's correct, and more on why that's important in a little bit. All right, so uh, the observant students will notice that if I cover up this part, it looks exactly like the position equation we had before, and that's simply because when we were talking about constant velocity motion, constant velocity was another way of saying acceleration equals zero, and if I take this equation and I plug in a equals zero, well, a times, you know, this stuff is just going to give us a zero term there, and we're left with x final equals x initial plus vt, which is, you know, which was our equation from before. So our constant velocity equation is, is hidden in this more complicated equation. You can always get to it from this if you, if you have to. Um, so the, the, the effect of that, I guess, is that this one half at squared this is how much the acceleration is changing the position of your object. And because this is t squared, as you know, time passes by, the effect of this term can be really, really big. Acceleration can really, really affect the motion of your, of your objects. Before we move on, let's do a little example using, uh, using this equation. Uh, I guess I'll leave it on the board. Okay, so let's say we have a car that is, I'll, I'll say it in words and then we'll do a picture on the board. Let's say I have a car that is moving to the right with an initial velocity of 10 meters per second. Uh, it undergoes some acceleration, uh, some unknown acceleration, and uh, three seconds later, it is measured to be a distance of 48 meters from where it started. So in other words, we have a car uh, moving to the right at 10 meters per second, some, somehow it ends up 48 meters away and it takes it three seconds, three seconds to get there. And over here it has some different velocity. I'll just write V question mark. We don't necessarily know what the velocity is over there. And we would like to know what it's acceleration is. Okay, so um, so hopefully you can see how these numbers fit into this equation. Um, if you don't, that is, that is an important problem solving step in kinematics problems and we'll have some uh, tips and tricks for that coming up in a, in a future lecture. 
Uh, but we can we can probably figure out where things go without too much trouble. Uh, the trickiest thing is actually x initial here because we're not really told anything about that. So um, so the idea in problems like this is we are allowed to start our coordinate system to place the origin wherever we want. Uh, there is not necessarily a right or wrong answer. Some choices are much more convenient than others. Um, some just make things more difficult. So it turns out to be a very convenient choice to say this initial position is x equals zero. We're just going to start our coordinate system here and have our you know positive x direction to the right as always, which is so if this is x equals zero, then 48 meters away from that is x equals plus 48. So you probably could have guessed that that was the right way to do it. Um, we could also call this x equals 100 and this x equals 148, and we get the same answer. It doesn't matter, but you know, using zero here is a very convenient choice. It makes the math easy, so, um, so that's what we do. Okay, so x initial is zero, x final is 48. Uh, our initial velocity is 10 meters per second. Uh, our time is three seconds. So note right here, if there was no acceleration, we only would have gone 30 meters. So the fact that we went further than that, 48 meters, means that we had some acceleration to the right. So before we do anything else, we should see we expect a positive number for A. Maybe not surprisingly. One half times A times T squared, which is three squared, which is nine. And I'm gonna erase the picture now and we'll just do a little bit of math. Note that I haven't plugged my units into this equation at all, so as long as I keep everything in SI units, meters and seconds, I don't have to carry them around and like cancel out the meters and seconds. Uh, you definitely can do that, but you can also trust me that as long as you start with SI units and plug the numbers into the equation correctly, you will end up with the right units at the end without having to check it. Okay, so uh, we have 48 equals 30 plus uh, so one half and nine, this is nine halves times a. 30, uh, moving to the other side, 48 minus 30 gives us 18 over here, equals nine halves a. So if I multiply both sides by two ninths, I gotta make my a's not look like my nines, two ninths, uh, those cancel and I have 2 ninths times 18, so 18 over 9 gives me 2, and another factor of 2 gives me 4, so I get my acceleration is 4, which, you know, in, in which is just a number. In physics land, that means our acceleration is plus 4 meters per second squared. Our acceleration is to the right, uh, 4 meters per second squared. All right, hopefully that's, uh, that's a useful thing to do to see how the how the numbers fit into this equation. All right, there's one last kinematics equation that I want to talk about that, uh, that pops up a lot. It turns out to be very useful in, in lots, of, lots of problems we do. Uh, and this one is called the uh, time-independent equation. The reason it's called the time-independent equation is that all of our other kinematics equations have the variable time in it. This one does not. Uh, and the reason, the math reason for that is because we actually take, <coughs> excuse me, we take our last equation, the x final equals x initial plus all that stuff. Um, that equation has a time in it. Our, I guess I'll write this down just to show you where it comes from. So we have this equation. We also have another equation we talked about, v final minus v initial is equal to, or sorry, v final equals v initial plus a times t. So the way we get this equation is from these two actually pretty simply. We solve this one for t, so we turn this equation into something that looks like t equals a bunch of stuff right, you know, it's v final minus v initial over the acceleration, I guess. Anyway, um, so we take that stuff and we plug that in for t in this equation, and then from that we get 
the equation that I'm about to write. So this isn't coming from some super mysterious place, it is just a little algebra magic done, I, I shouldn't use the word magic, it is a little algebra done on the, uh, on the two equations we've already seen. So this is really telling us something we already know in, in some way or another. So the equation is this, uh, v final squared minus v initial squared equals 2 times a times delta x. We could also write this as, you know, x final minus x initial, but it's easier to write it as delta x for now. So this is our time independent equation. And this equation is very useful, you know, when, when we do, if we don't know how long something takes, but we know how fast it was going at the beginning and we know how fast it was going at the end, we can plug those numbers in and the time never, never needs to come into it. Um, this equation turns out to be very useful, especially when your initial or your final velocity is zero, because then you can plug zero into one of those and the equation becomes, you know, becomes much, much simpler. Um, so we'll see more examples using this, um, using this next time.